Hello, today's lesson is going to be on pneumatics and gas laws. Quick overview of pneumatic power. Uh, pneumatics is the use of gas flowing under pressure to transmit power from one location to another. And gas in a pneumatic system behaves like a spring since it is compressible. Let's take a look at pneumatic systems compared to hydraulic systems. Pneumatic systems use a compressible gas, which is generally air, which is easy to obtain, and there's no disposal issues. They also possess a quicker, quicker, jumpier motion, which is great for fast, repeated jobs like a nail gun. They're not as precise as hydraulics um, due to the compressible nature of gas. They require a lubricant, whereas in hydraulic systems using oil, um, they have a built-in lubricant. They are generally cleaner, which is great for clean rooms and food processing. They often operate at pressures of around 100 pounds per square inch, um, which results in generally producing less power. So we have some very important properties of gases that are going to give us some fun as we try to solve some problems with them. Um, gases are affected by three variables. So three very important variables, your temperature, your pressure, and your volume. Um, gases have no definite volume. They're highly compressible and they are lighter than liquids. So what do we mean by absolute pressure? First of all, let's look at gauge pressure. If we look at a pneumatic system, we will usually see a gauge and the gauge will show us the gauge pressure, which does is just the pressure um, on the gauge and doesn't account for the atmospheric pressure that's on all sides of the system. Um, so we're surrounded at any given time by a certain amount of air pressure. Um, and so in order to calculate the absolute pressure, we need to add in that atmospheric pressure plus the gauge pressure. And so the gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure is the absolute pressure, and that's what the number that we're going to need to use when we do calculations in pneumatics. So how do we calculate absolute pressure? Um, pressure in general for pneumatics is going to be calculated in pounds per square inch or PSI. Um, and we are always going to use 14.7 PSI as our standard atmospheric pressure. What that means is surrounding us at any time, we are breathing in and sitting in rooms that have an air pressure of 14.7 PSI. So if a gauge reads 120 PSI, what is the absolute pressure? The calculation is just to add the gauge pressure to the standard atmospheric pressure of 14.7, and so in this case it would be 134.7 PSI. Let's take a moment to do a quick recap of Pascal's law. It states that pressure exerted by a confined fluid acts undiminished equally in all directions, and pressure being the force per unit area exerted on a fluid against the surfaces. The formula we're going to use for Pascal's law is pressure equals force over area, and this is a quick recap of what each of the components of the formula mean. Here's an example of how we might use Pascal's law. The question here is how much pressure can be produced with a 3 inch diameter cylinder and 60 pounds of force? So there are the values that we know and our unknowns. Let's start by figuring out the formula. Always remember to double check that you're using radius where you should use radius and diameter where you should use diameter. In this case, we have the radius of 1.5. Um, and so when we plug that into the formula, we get an area of 7.07 .07 inches squared. So let's put that into the Pascal's law formula. Pressure is force over area. When we put those numbers in, the 60 pounds of force, the 7.07 .07 inches squared, of area, we get a pressure of 8.47 pounds per inch squared. This sets us up to start looking into the three perfect gas laws, Boyle's law, Charles law, and Gay-Lussac's law. All right, our first perfect gas law, Boyle's law. Boyle's law is a law that specifically looks at the volume of a gas when it's at a constant temperature and how it varies 
inversely with the pressure. So we're just going to be focusing on volume and pressure. The formula that we'll use for Boyle's Law is the pressure initially times the volume initially is going to be equal to the pressure at a different time times the volume at that different time for the same system. So if you look over at this interesting little graphic here, you notice the yellow area with the dots in it. That's representing the volume. And so you can see that volume increasing and decreasing. And every time that it increases, you'll notice that the pressure goes down. So looking at that little gauge there, that pressure goes down when the volume increases and the pressure comes up as the volume decreases. You can also see the little um, graph on the side and it shows how that relationship is inversely proportional, which means when one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. Let's take a look at an example of how Boyle's Law could be used. Keep in mind that Boyle's Law is essentially P1 V1 is equal to P2V2. The question here is a cylinder is filled with 40 inches cubed of air at a pressure of 60 psi. Note that pressure is the gauge pressure. The cylinder is compressed to 10 inches cubed. What is the resulting absolute pressure? So let's start by jotting down all of the known values. There's uh, all the information that we know. We need to find P2, but we need to find the absolute P2. So first we need to convert P1 to absolute pressure. And so we're gonna do that by just adding the atmospheric pressure of 14.7 PSI. So we're given 60 PSI, we add, up the, add on the 14.7 PSI, and we have 74.7 PSI. So this formula in um, Boyle's Law is made to be used with absolute pressure. So anytime you see that formula, double check that you're using absolute pressure. We substitute and solve, put our numbers in for um, all the stuff that we know, and our answer ends up being um, 300 PSI. And that is the absolute pressure because that's what the problem asked us to calculate. So when we looked at Boyle's Law, we didn't need to worry about temperature because temperature is not involved in that calculation. The remaining two perfect gas laws involve temperature and temperature needs to be in absolutes similar to pressure. So we are working with the US customary system. So we're working in degrees Fahrenheit and zero degrees Fahrenheit does not represent a true absolute zero. Absolute zero is actually negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit. So the absolute temperature that we want to measure in degrees Rankine, which is how we can get an absolute zero that'll work in the calculations that we need to, to um, use, um, will be calculated by adding 460 to the number of degrees Fahrenheit that we're given in the problem. So if the temperature of the air in a system is 65 degrees Fahrenheit, what is the absolute temperature? We will just add on the 460. And in this case, we would have 525 degrees Rankine. The second perfect gas law we're gonna study is Charles Law. Charles Law states that the volume of a gas increases or decreases as the temperature increases or decreases, provided the amount of gas and the pressure remain constant. The formula that we will use to express Charles Law is V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. And in this case, temperature needs to be absolute. So if you look at the little animation here, you'll notice that the pressure is not changing. However, the temperature and the volume are changing. And this time we have a direct correlation. That means as one increases, the other increases. So as the um, volume increases, the temperature increases. And as the volume decreases, the temperature decreases. Second of the perfect gas laws is Charles Law. We're going to look at a quick example here. So if an expandable container is filled with 28 inches cubed of air and sitting in ice water that's at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the container is then moved from the icy water and heated to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. 
what is the resulting volume? So Charles Law states that the volume and temperature are going to increase together or decrease together. So let's look at what we have here. We have a bunch of givens. Our missing piece of information is the resulting volume. But remember how when we're working with these temperatures in the perfect gas laws, we need to convert them to absolutes. So those temperatures are in degrees Fahrenheit. So we add 460 to each of them and we end up with degrees Rankin, which is basically from absolute zero, how many degrees um, is, is that value. So then we can take those converted temperatures that are now in ranking and use them in Charles Law to figure out what the resulting volume will be. So we put all the values into that equation and use the calculator and you should end up with a resulting volume 2 of 38 inches cubed. So looking back at our volume 1, it was 28 inches cubed and so the volume increased as the temperature increased, which is what Charles Law suggested it would do. The third of the perfect gas laws is Gay-Lussac's law. It states that the absolute pressure of a gas increases or decreases as the temperature increases or decreases, provided the amount of gas and the volume remain constant. So pressure and temperature are the only pieces that we're concerned about here, but both of them need to be converted into absolutes before we can put them into this equation. Let's look at an example of how we might use Gay-Lussac's law. A 300 inch cubed sealed air tank is sitting outside. So the volume isn't going to change. It's a sealed air tank. In the morning, the temperature inside the tank is 62 degrees Fahrenheit and the pressure gauge reads 120 PSI. By afternoon, the temperature inside the tank is expected to be close to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. What will the absolute pressure be at this point? So here is a quick summary of the information that we know. And we need to convert our pressure to absolute pressure and our temperature to absolute temperature. We're going to put it into this formula here, um, the Gay-Lussac formula. We substitute and solve, put in all of the information that you know, make sure that you're putting in those absolute pressures and temperatures. And our final pressure should be 140 PSI, pounds per square inch. So let's take this a step further. We figured out what the final absolute pressure is, which is what the question asked. But what would be the gauge pressure? Um, so the gauge pressure here, we can work backwards and take the absolute pressure and subtract the atmospheric pressure, and we would be left with the gauge pressure. So in this case, it would be 127.2 PSI.